I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about a particular speech by a president 65 years ago that has some very crucial implications uh, for the president. That's me. You can find me on Twitter. That's my handle. I'm the director of grassroots advocacy at EFF. And we're going to be talking about surveillance versus democracy in America and the particular warning uh, that was issued to us 65 years ago this January. So, so uh, just a show of hands, Ike, does the word mean anything to anybody? If you can place it, okay. Dwight D. Eisenhower, right? He was the Supreme Allied Commander in World War II, as responsible as any other single person, quite frankly, for defeating Nazi Germany. He was a two-term president. Uh, he, and in that capacity in particular, continued some of the work he'd done uh, as a military chief in establishing something that he would warn us about. He was voted Gallup's most admired, admired man 12 times. He built the national interstate highway system. He established NASA, and he had a particular speech on January 17, 1961, from which I'll read you an excerpt um, soon, in which he issued a warning, the likes of which uh, we've not really seen in America since, with the possible exception of a particular speech by Senator Dianne Feinstein um, last year, in the context of a situation we'll talk about in just a little bit. The Snowden revelations. Let's go to 2013. I want to, before we get there, I want to just read you a little bit of uh, Dwight. Uh, Ike's last address uh, as the American president. Let's see if I can skip back that. There's a particular line in here I want you to hear. So he speaks about the combination of a large military industry, which he felt compelled to help support and create in order to defeat Nazi Germany. And he talks about the combination of it with the profit motive that underlies industry. And he speaks of a military industrial complex that he forecasts will come to threaten democracy in America. He says, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex, the potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or our democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. And so what we're going to talk about over the next few minutes are some ways in which his predictions, unfortunately, came true. So in 2013, Edward Snowden revealed among other things, that the sworn testimony of multiple senior officials before Congress uh, was not true. And these were uh, questions, for instance, uh, as straightforward as does the NSA monitor millions of Americans? And Congress had been assured under oath by the Director of National Intelligence just three months before the Snowden leaks that it does not. And I want to talk a little bit about a couple different sets of institutions that have buried their heads in the sand since. Courts exist, of course, to enforce constitutional rights. In the Federalist Papers, the independence of the judiciary is described as the crux on which liberty rests, right? It is the, uh, uh, if you think about the courts in the context of uh, judicial supremacy and the, uh, the system, the constitutional separation of powers and checks and balances between them, the courts are our constitutional guardians. And when, for instance, hiding behind either the constitutional standing doctrine, which uh, I'm welcome to take questions about later, or the state secrets privilege, also we could talk about that later. These are judicial doctrines that have essentially enabled judicial abdication. Um, similarly, Congress, despite having been informed from the press about what the NSA is, and the FBI as well, and the DEA for that matter, or your local police department are doing around the country with respect to surveillance, has never actually actively investigated to find the facts. Still, even after having discovered that executive officials have lived under oath, Congress has deferred to those officials. Uh, not once has ever invited any of the whistleblowers to testify. And just to sh uh, share a quick timeline here, it was three years ago that Snowden revealed mass surveillance. Just last year, Congress adopted in the USA Freedom Act a uh, initial set of reforms to marginally increase transparency, particularly at the secret federal court responsible for surveillance. And part of the hook for my talk, what I want to focus you on, is the end of next year. Uh, there is a, a key statute, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that underlies the NSA's uh, dragnet spying. It is already set to expire. So in the next year, Congress will examine mass surveillance. The question is, will it do anything about it? We're going to move now to uh, another area, a little bit of history here, another show of hands for whom uh, does COINTELPRO mean anything for folks in the audience? Not a single one of you? Fascinating. I'm so glad I'm here. So COINTELPRO stands for the counterintelligence programs. And this is a set of uh, programs, particularly run out of the FBI, that the Congress investigated very actively in the 1970s. This was a two-year investigation that compiled tens of thousands of pages of documents. And the U.S. Senate in 1976 described 
uh, COINTELPRO as a sophisticated vigilante operation aimed squarely at suppressing the legitimate use of First Amendment rights of speech and association. And I want to just make sure you understand who some of the targets of COINTELPRO included. This was a 40-year campaign to, in the FBI's word, neutralize domestic social movements. They included the mainline civil rights movement as well as the militant black power movement. They included the Puerto Rican independence movement. They included the movements for equal rights for women and the movement to end the war in Vietnam. This uh, multi-pronged uh, assault on not just particular social movements, but through them, democracy in America is what I want you to focus on, and I want you to place that in the context of Eisenhower's warning. Any uh, guesses as to COINTELPRO's most famous target? Yep, you got it. There he is. Uh, the letter from Birmingham jail remains a piece of very uh, crucial modern American literature I'd invite you to read if you haven't before. Its implications are especially vital to consider in a time when state violence has emerged not only uh, fully fanged as it has been for 400 years, but for the first time perhaps in American history with transparency to the public. And the letter from Birmingham jail particularly relates to what solidarity looks like and what does a commitment to justice mean uh, at a time when justice somewhere is threatened. Um, and I want to talk briefly about the civil rights movement in the context of Dr. King and the assault on his character and his life by the FBI. Uh, the civil rights movement is typically depicted as victorious, right? A shining moment in our nation's history. I just visited DC last week and had a chance to attend the New African American History Museum where, of course, appropriately, Dr. King uh, and his uh, colleagues were lauded. There was one plaque acknowledging COINTELPRO and the FBI's vicious witch hunt against that movement, but while the assassinations of civil rights leaders, of course, loom large in our history and the continuing legacy of state violence, we still occasionally think of the civil rights movement as victorious. And I want to uh, basically examine here its policy uh, experiences, the extent to which it actually did win what it was looking for. So we won voting rights, right? The right to cast a ballot for what that counts. Uh, essentially, you could, if you were to be critical of that, say it's a right to choose between uh, the opportunities or the choices constructed for us by the 2% of the American public that actually donates to political campaigns. Um, there was another policy victory. Um, we'll get to that in a minute, but I want to just notice some of the losses here. Among the things that the civil rights movement won in addition to voting rights were desegregation, right? Think about the ground of the Brown versus Board decision. It recognized the distinction between de jure, which is to say enforced housing discrimination and educational discrimination, and de facto, which is to say market-driven discrimination. The awareness of de jure versus de facto discrimination has eroded and faded from the federal judiciary entirely. In fact, the 14th Amendment, if you compare it to the Brown versus Board era, has basically been flipped on its head, which is to say, the policy victories of the civil rights movement not only failed to crest over the movement's aims, which included a right to eat, a right to housing, a right to education, a right to health care, but even the core victories of the civil rights movement, in particular voting rights, uh, there is a key section of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5, which uh, until it was allowed by Congress to expire, pardon me, until it was overturned by the Supreme Court having been extended by Congress, uh, forced southern states with a history of discrimination to pre-clear changes in their voting laws with the Justice Department. The uh, overturning of Section 5 of the, Just of the Voting Rights Act essentially returns us to, in some respects, even a pre-civil rights movement era, even with respect to voting, while all of the movement's uh, aims, of course, its deeper underlying aims, remain unsecured. I want to talk about some of the contemporary social movements that have continued to be targeted by surveillance. We talked before about mass surveillance, now we're talking about targeted surveillance. One example is the environmental movement. If you go to the federal prisons in, um, uh, around the country, the communications management units, they're called, where people convicted of terror offenses are held, you might be surprised to find a substantial minority on the order of 30 to 40 percent were young and are now middle-aged white men, particularly from Oregon and Washington State, whose worst crimes could be characterized as environmentally motivated vandalism or, in the very worst cases, arson. And they are serving terror sentences decades, in some cases 35-year sentences for terror offenses having taken uh, great pains to avoid 
any threat to life, the peace movement. Uh, people, I mentioned before that the movement to uh, stop the war in Iraq was particularly uh, infiltrated and impacted, neutralized, you might say, by the FBI. Its contemporary equivalent, uh, working to stop the conflicts in which our country is currently engaged, has also been very thoroughly targeted uh, for not just surveillance in the sense of monitoring, but suppression as well, the Occupy movement, its experience at the hands of militarized police is very well documented. Uh, I'm going to read you a quick quote where you can see it for yourself. Jeffrey Stone from the University of Chicago, my undergrad alma mater, describes a national perception of peril and a concerted campaign by government to promote a sense of national hysteria by exaggeration, manipulation, and distortion. You might say that fear-mongering is inducing us to accept constraints on the liberties and democratic processes that President Eisenhower warned us would be at risk by the combination of a profit motive and an impulse toward public safety, especially in the context of this national hysteria, prompted by exaggeration, manipulation, and distortion. <clears throat> so we've talked about mass surveillance. We've talked a little bit about politically motivated targeted surveillance. I now want to shift the lens to what we might describe as street level surveillance. These are uh, programs and tools, technologies, often developed for military application originally that are deployed increasingly around the country by local police departments. Uh, the most conspicuous example, you'll see them uh, in some US cities increasingly, are armored vehicles. There was one um, uh, very controversially stopped in Berkeley after local activists discovered it, uh, the plans that is to procure it. They uh, unfortunately are becoming increasingly common in US cities. There's a fascinating story here to be told about the, uh, I believe it was the Marines in particular, who were receptive to a push from military families in the middle of the Iraq war to buy more mine resistant armor plated vehicles. These I guess were Humvees that had a particular design in the undercarriage to deflect explosive blasts. Uh, and in some respects, the, uh, there was a whistleblower, for instance, who revealed the need to buy more of these and uh, essentially the military's abdication of its responsibility to protect our troops. And while in some respects you might describe it as a victory that then I believe thousands if not hundreds of these MRAPs were uh, bought, built, deployed, they now need somewhere to go. And the weapons manufacturers and the military uh, agencies that, that develop and deploy these weapons, wants to send them somewhere, local police departments become them. Machine guns are another that are deployed around the country, and I want to focus particularly on surveillance equipment and a few different kinds. So drones you hear about, particularly in the context of CIA assassinations and strikes abroad. Let's just pause here for a very brief digression. People sometimes forget that the victims of US, particularly CIA drone strikes, include US citizens targeted for their speech. Uh, a particular one who was never accused of raising a gun, but uh, as a propagandist essentially uh, was declared persona non grata and an enemy of the state, even while his family sought to vindicate his right to due process in federal court. Um, another victim of drone strikes included that person's 16 year old son who was never accused of anything, including even mere propaganda. Uh, but uh, the point I want to, zooming back from those particular individuals and the constitutional rights at stake, focus on. Well, maybe two. Let's look first at the empirical data with respect to our drone strikes before we're getting back to surveillance by local police. Um, defensible. The director of the CIA, John Brennan, has claimed before Congress that uh, the civilian collateral casualties owing to drone strikes are infinitesimal, that uh, essentially every dead body is a militant. And the only independent study to date conducted by human rights clinics at NYU and Stanford established that over 90% of the deaths from drone strikes are collateral civilian deaths. Essentially, in the same way that we talked about Snowden showing that executive officials testifying under oath about the limits of mass surveillance were lying, so has the CIA about the collateral deaths related to drone strikes. There's a further piece um, I could share here. There's a symposium article uh, from a symposium at Loyola Law School I'm happy to share with people uh, to the extent it interests you that I uh, gave a speech the week after the Attorney General at the time, Eric Holder, had announced the supposed criteria limiting drone strikes. Uh, you could describe them as remote robotic assassinations. And the particular point I want to draw here is that while the administration, the Obama administration, has very uh, thoughtfully attempted to articulate limiting principles, there is no transparent or neutral forum in which those principles are contested. And among them are, for instance, imminence. There has to be an imminent threat. Uh, there's no forum in which to contest imminence. And when imminence includes killing US citizen propagandists, it starts to stretch the definition of the word in ways that render the principles themselves suspect. 
so we talked there about CIA drone strikes. I want to just then draw the parallel. Drones were developed for military and quasi-military application abroad. They're now being deployed by police departments across the United States to monitor essentially law-abiding civilian populations en masse. Police body cameras are sometimes presented as a police accountability tool. I want to just invite you to think about a few of the ways in which body cameras not only might fail to achieve their intended purpose, but also expand on and exacerbate the threat of surveillance that we've been talking about. So uh, a couple just points to consider here. The first, of course, is that police body cameras don't face police. They face you. Uh, so they don't actually capture what a police officer might do. And in cases where a police officer might, as they are often documented of having done, planting weapons or contraband on a suspect, a, a body camera won't necessarily capture that. There's also the uh, uh, frequent phenomenon of body cameras being turned off at inopportune or for police opportune times. The biggest hole in the bucket is a public right of access to the footage, the raw footage captured by police body cameras. A police body camera with a, and a program to deploy them across a police force without a robust public right of access to the raw, unedited footage is worse than useless, particularly because it becomes another vector for mass surveillance. They're only useful as police accountability tools if the public can get the footage and if police don't have a right to edit it first. There's a further problem here, which is to say even with video, of police murdering someone in broad daylight, I'm talking about the Eric Garner case in New York. Are people familiar with it? I can't breathe, right? Eric Garner was, was murdered by police officers on tape, viewed by tens if not hundreds of millions of people, and the only person who went to jail associated with that incident was the person who captured the incident on video. Say what you will about it, but the point is transparency doesn't equal accountability. There is a hole in the law. And I'll name very specifically what it is. It's the qualified immunity doctrine that basically says that as long as police act in what the courts will construe as good faith uh, and acknowledging well-established rights, they can get away with violating rights in particular instances if a reasonable person in the same situation might have done the same thing. Uh, when you couple this with the erosion in the 14th Amendment uh, equal protection doctrine, what it basically means is that if you want to establish a claim of racial profiling by a police officer, you basically need video of them beating someone while screaming racial obscenities. And anything short of that is insufficient to establish a claim. That is, of course, not what the founders envisioned when they wrote the Constitution and uh, you know, wrote poems about how we would be a land of the free and a home of the brave. Is anybody familiar with the Secure Communities Initiative? It's very well known in immigrant communities because it was a program launched at the very end of the Bush administration, uh, enabling and setting up essentially the Obama administration to become uh, the one under which our nation would deport historic numbers of undocumented workers. The Secure Communities Initiative was presented as a way to uh, streamline the removal of criminal aliens from the United States. And what the FBI built on its back out of public view was the Next Generation Initiative. This is a biometric data collection scheme applicable not just to immigrants, but to all Americans. And it demonstrates a continuation of a long established pattern, which is to say the justification of novel powers or programs or equipment for particular ends, and then their expansion well beyond the mission creep. And the mission creep behind biometrics. And when I talk about biometrics, we're talking about fingerprints, your iris uh, patterns, even the sound of your voice, the way you walk. Uh, gate detection algorithms are increasingly being applied to video feeds, facial algorithms, so just the shape of your face and the contours of the shadows on it. All of these are biometrics that are increasingly being tracked in government databases. And I want to talk briefly about a particular tool that you might have heard described as a stingray that is used to monitor uh, cell phone networks. These are also increasingly deployed by local police. And there are a couple things I want to say about it. The first, the first generation of Stingrays uh, were capable of monitoring cell phone traffic and network traffic, but they weren't capable, for instance, of hacking a phone or planting malware or denying service, all of which the later versions of the device are able to do. And we've had many reports of these devices being used in the context of suppressing not just monitoring, but suppressing peaceful demonstrations. For instance, demonstrations uh, by the Movement for Black Lives. There's certainly a strong uh, sense that they were being used against the Occupy movement, though no one knew at the time because stingrays weren't public yet. 
The first known deployment of a stingray happened in a protest in which I participated in 2003 in Miami resisting the free trade area of the Americas. It was the precursor to the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that you might have heard about since. And these devices weren't, and after that, in Baltimore alone, Baltimore, Maryland, the police department used stingrays thousands of times without any judicial warrants over the course of the mid-2000s. The only way we even know they exist is because a jailhouse defendant, someone representing themselves against a fraud charge who uh, admitted his guilt, as far as I know, um, was curious how he got caught. And in exploring his court documents, caught an accidental government reference to a stingray. It was the trade name of the first generation of the devices, which were sold and licensed to police departments around the country under FBI-mandated contracts, which required the devices to remain secret. Not just from you and me, and not just from the New York Times or you know, the papers of record of the cities in which they were deployed, but also kept secret from policymakers and particularly judges. When the FBI contracts with a weapons manufacturer to then sell surveillance equipment to local police departments on the condition that judges not find out, there is something wrong. And since then, it's interesting, uh, I think we'll get to this actually at a different point, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's happening uh, to curtail stingrays because it suggests one vector that the movement to resist mass surveillance might take. Uh, so yeah, we just talked a little bit about this. Stingrays were used before any policymakers or judges knew about them, thousands of times without warrants. Also in Baltimore, and the only reason we know so much about Baltimore is because it's a city very close to DC, which is not a federal district. So it happens to be a place that uh, reporters and investigative journalists have uh, explored and dug into particularly. There's no reason to think that any of the things we're talking about in Baltimore have not happened in other cities around the country. Uh, the most recent revelation from Baltimore, this came from uh, Bloomberg if I remember correctly, was persistent aerial surveillance of the sort that we thought only drones could enable, only they used manned flights to do it. So it legally is indistinguishable from persistent drone surveillance. Incidentally, I should note in the midst of all this, in the mid uh, the later 2000s, the Supreme Court ruled in U.S. versus Jones that persistent location tracking using GPS devices is constitutionally offensive. So there are some interesting cross currents here to think about. This is the part I wanna, I wanna focus here for you all as young people and stepping into the society that's already made these decisions. So what might you do to recover your rights? States are individually legislating to impose checks and balances, impose transparency that Congress and the courts have abdicated. And there are some great examples of this here in California, the California Electronic Communications Privacy Act, Cal ECPA is an example. It essentially requires police in California who might want to examine your, for instance, email stored in the cloud like your Gmail or your um, Yahoo, if you still use it, uh, email, um, to get a warrant first. It's worth just briefly digressing about warrants. A warrant stands for the principle that some neutral arbiter has to say it's okay for police to do what they're doing. It's not a functional constraint on police activity. It's a functional constraint on police abuses because it's the first and the only point in most investigative chains where the police have to answer to someone who is not within the department. And when you have these sorts of searches absent judicial warrants, warrants exist and they're required in the Constitution under the Fourth Amendment for a reason, and it's because the state doesn't always get it right. In fact, the state often gets it wrong, but without a warrant requirement, we never know. Uh, wait, I think there was one other thing I wanted to get to there, yeah, sorry. Illinois, I wanted to talk, oh right, and then here. So uh, the state of Illinois, just a few weeks ago, maybe two months ago, adopted a new law, and as far as I know, is the strongest around the country with respect to the stingrays, the MC catchers, the cell phone spying devices that we talked about just a minute ago. And not only does the Illinois law require a warrant to use them, but unlike the half dozen other states that have similar requirements, Illinois uniquely allows criminal defendants who are uh, accused of crimes based on evidence collected from stingrays to exclude that evidence from criminal trial. It also, particularly the Illinois law, prohibits even with a judicial order the use of the later versions of the devices to hack a phone or plant malware or deny service. And that's a big deal because if you're in a demonstration, or even if you're not in a demonstration, let's say you're just walking down the street and you see police beating someone or perhaps, God forbid, shooting someone, right? You know how important cell phone video and transmission and social media has been to enabling a public discourse. When police have tools to deny service to phones or hack them to prevent that kind of video from being captured in the first place, 
it's a hole in the bucket of what little transparency we do have into these kinds of abuses. And that leads me right here uh, um, to, to Silicon Valley. We're in Santa Clara County. This uh, summer, perhaps fall, I guess it was August, I think, when the ordinance took effect, uh, Supervisor Joe Simidian on your Board of Supervisors sponsored and the Board of Supervisors ultimately adopted an ordinance, the first of its kind in the country, which the ACLU now has now launched a campaign to replicate in two dozen other cities around the country, a requirement that when police want to buy surveillance gear, they have to ask your local elected policymakers first. That should not be rocket science. That shouldn't be revolutionary. That's exactly what you would expect in a free society, but it takes active local intervention to make it happen. So I want to just sketch out a quick historical narrative for you. 1945, Eisenhower wins the Second World War. The crucial legal results of it you might describe as the Nuremberg Principles, right? The trial, strict liability for torture. If you commit torture, it doesn't matter who told you to do it. it, doesn't matter if there is a national security emergency, it is a crime, full stop, period. That's what World War II supposedly stood for. In the 50s and through 70s, the CIA staged a series of coups across the global south, particularly in Latin America. I think the number of uh, countries ultimately impacted bordered on a dozen. In the 1990, here in San Jose, do people know the name Gary Webb? Fascinating. Okay, I'm even doubly glad I'm here. You if there's any one thing I would invite you to do after my talk, it's Google Gary Webb. He has a book called uh, Dark Conspiracy, I think is the name of the book. It's a tome. He was an investigative reporter for the San Jose Mercury News who revealed a story that would have been the biggest story of the 1990s had not the corporate media silenced it with the complicity of the national security agencies. This is not a conspiracy theory. This was admitted by the CIA in the late 90s, five years after Gary Webb's career was ruined. He was vilified, lost his job, ultimately died of a suicide entailing two gunshots to the head. That's Gary Webb. Uh, fast forward, so, uh, and, and what he established was that the CIA was running drugs into Los Angeles and Miami, that the narco traffickers who were killing cops on the streets of Miami and Los Angeles were trained, funded, and equipped by the CIA. This is all part of the Iran-Contra scandal and the effort of the Reagan administration to basically run a rogue foreign policy in Latin America. But the point of that is that when cops were dying in Miami and LA, what happened as a result? police militarized. That's when used military equipment started finding its way into the streets of otherwise peaceful U.S. cities. Fast forward the tape another 10 years, the CIA gets caught torturing people. They destroy the evidence, particularly in the forms of videotapes. Fast forward a few more years, the CIA develops a whole new form of human rights abuse while lying to the public again. 2013, to hide its criminal trail, the CIA conducts an espionage operation targeting the U.S. Senate. This, is what this, this triggered the speech by Dianne Feinstein that I described as maybe the only other one like Ike's in our nation's history, where she described, this was only three years ago, a constitutional crisis in a speech on the Senate floor, which has not been resolved. We go from police militarization responding to the drug war to Ferguson in 2014 and the continuing movement to uh, uh, establish that black lives, in fact, matter. And I want to ask you, do we actually live in a land that you might describe as free? Okay. Slavery uh, remains legal under the terms of the 13th Amendment as long as it's in prison, and there are more black men in prison today than there were enslaved at the height of the institution. So do you think that slavery ended, or did it just shift? CIA torture in the face of the gains of the Second World War, we not only committed violations of the principles that we fought a world war to establish, but we have since said it's okay to do it. Okay, um, with that thought, I am so sorry, but I That's have to good. cut you off because we're running short on time.